Natalie Hemming had been in an abusive relationship with her partner Paul for almost 10 years. However, in 2016, she decided finally that enough was enough. She wasn't going to put up with the violence anymore. So she planned to take her children and leave him. But before she could do this, Natalie would vanish without a trace. A hunt for the missing mother of three would ensue with the suspicion being firmly placed on Paul. This is what happens when a controlling and possessive partner believes that if he can't have you, nobody can. This is the heartbreaking case of Natalie Hemming. because I had surgery on my nose a few weeks ago. Those of you who don't know me on my channel will not know about the constant case of me trying to be able to breathe through my nose. So if I look a bit weird, that's why. Although arguably, some would argue, I do look weird most of the time, so it'll just be more of the same. Today's case is one of those that I wanted to cover because I've worked in both safeguarding of children, but also family dynamics. And when you consider in this modern day where we are so aware of issues around coercive control, domestic violence, still people die every single week because they stay in relationships that they don't deserve to be in and that arguably they should be to, able to safely remove themselves from. But so often when you choose to leave an abusive relationship, you are more at risk of harm than you have ever been before. And that's one of the reasons why people stay in terrible relationships. Also, before I get on with today's case, you'll notice I'm wearing a new merch drop. This is my favorite design that we've done so far. I absolutely love it. There's gonna be a lot more of these because we're linking in with young designers and giving them an opportunity to promote their own work on this channel. So hopefully some of you are gonna think that this is gorgeous and want to buy it. I'm going to have one in every single color. Let's start with today's case. Natalie and Paul Hemmings, they were living together as a family. They had three children and they lived in Milton Keynes in the UK. Natalie actually had one of those children independently to Hemmings himself. So she had Kirsty, that was the eldest daughter, and Kirsty came from a previous relationship. But Natalie and Hemmings had two further children, a son called Evan and then a daughter. In 2016, at this point, the children were aged 12, 6 and 3. But as I've said in the introduction of this case, they've been together a decade. So for her oldest daughter, nonetheless, even though they are not actually connected blood-wise, they would certainly be connected emotionally. She would be looking to him as her father. Hemmings worked as a carpet salesman. And don't get me wrong, I appreciate that most salespeople are lovely. My own father was a salesperson. He was the most honest human being and the most wonderful human being that there could ever have been. And all of his customers trusted him with a loyalty that I think is really hard to replicate in most circumstances. But there are also certain individuals who fall into the salespeople category that, I don't know, can be a bit con artist-like in the way that they approach things. And I genuinely think that Hemmings falls into this category. Natalie, she worked as an administrator at a Mercedes dealership but she'd actually previously been in the Navy. She'd also worked in a nursery and as a person, people really liked her. She's described as really kind. She was described as caring, helpful. And I think that when you consider a career in the Navy, that's somebody who's willing to literally die for their country. Nursery takes a great deal of empathy and therefore it paints a picture of a woman who has these really delightful attributes to her nature. 
Also, her sister said that in spite of the fact that she had the qualities I've just talked about, she was also loud, she was also outspoken. And it intrigues me when we look at cases where an individual finds themselves in circumstances where they are being domestically abused, because when people are looking at their character, such as being loud and outspoken, one doesn't imagine that that person with that kind of personality will end up in an abusive relationship. And obviously that's a myth, because an abuser, a predator, is very clever at manipulating the individuals that they spend time with and build relationships towards them with. So arguably, even if somebody seems like a complete extrovert and is really sure of themselves, that doesn't mean they're not at risk of finding themselves in a challenging relationship. And to some degree, because often people with that nature feel that people wouldn't see them as an easy target, they themselves don't necessarily believe that they'd ever end up in a relationship like this. And that can cause them an issue because that bias personally means that they'll believe that they would be able to sniff out this kind of character should they enter their world. It's also said that her children were basically her life. They were literally the most important things to her. And I think that if you are a good mother, that's exactly how you feel. You feel that your children help to create who you are you celebrate everything about who they are as children and who they're becoming as human beings and the adults that they're going to grow into and you devote yourself and dedicate yourself to that journey with them but in spite of all that her relationship with Hemmings is really imperfect so they allegedly had quite a volatile relationship and if she did have as her sister suggested the personality traits of being quite loud and outspoken if you are with somebody who wants to control you that is going to be something they struggle with. They don't want somebody who speaks out. They don't want somebody who shouts at them back. They don't want somebody who isn't a good little victim to some degree. And she is probably problematic for him because she doesn't like to stand down. Equally, that makes her more at risk of violence because abusers are consistently looking for permission bases to use violence and aggression against their partner. It's a form of domination, it's the form of power control, but also it's a form of making sure that that individual recognises the authority dynamics in the family, i.e. I'm in charge and you need to accept that by shutting up. But when you have the tenacity within your personality where that doesn't sit right with you, you're going to fight that kind of domination, but that is going to put you in more danger. And again, Anybody who's in a domestically abusive relationship, whether you've got a massively sensitive temperament and you say nothing, or whether you fight back, what you need to know above everything else is it's not your fault and you need to get the hell out. And I think that perpetrators of domestic abuse are so clever at manipulating their victims into believing that somehow they have caused the issue, that often you can find yourself in a circumstance and situation where you're living with a predator but you feel that you are to blame for the problems that are affecting your relationship. And that's whether, as I said, you're somebody who just puts your head down and gets on with it, or you're somebody who genuinely fights back. And it won't surprise you to know that Natalie's family really didn't like Hemming. They wanted her to leave him. They knew that he was bad news. They understood that he was treating her horribly, and they loved her. But again, we all know that a violent predator in a relationship is not a violent predator 100% of the time. In fact, often, the majority of the time, that individual can be a decent human being. 80% of the time, they might be a fabulous father. 82% of the time, they might be a good person within the house who helps you tidy up, pay bills. 75% of the time, they might be a loving partner. So when people expect you to leave because they see you in your worst moments or hear about that situation unfolding secondhand from you and when you're feeling down about the relationship and therefore tell them all the negatives about that person, they're not living the rest of the relationship when that person's being good to you. So when people say leave, it's a lot more simple to say it than to do it, aside from the obvious other issue, which is that leaving domestically abusive relationships can often be the most dangerous thing that you can do unless you have the right support strategies in place that can cradle you through that process. But understandably, for Natalie's family, Hemming is a horrible human being who does not deserve to be in the same area that she is. Now, it's interesting because Natalie had actually taken Hemming's second name, so the last name, even though the couple were not married. And they were meant to be getting married but every time she went ahead and arranged the wedding, Paul would go ahead and cancel all the plans without even in 
performing Natalie. And to put it into context, he'd called off that wedding three times. Can you imagine the humiliation level of that? You're a young woman, you've got kids to this guy, you're planning the wedding because apparently he wants to be with you. You've got his second name, which for you is a sign of loyalty, but for him will be a sign of power, that he has a level of territory and ownership over you. And you believe that he is firmly committed to the relationship. So you go about busying yourself with the idea of your perfect wedding day, even though you know in the background things aren't necessarily that perfect. And then he literally cancels the plans without your knowledge. Just gonna throw it out there. If a man did that to me, he would be forcefully ejected from my property and probably the items that he brought with him would be around him, but maybe not in the state that he'd hoped they would be. That sounded very vengeful there, didn't it? But if you go ahead and cancel somebody's wedding day three times without letting your partner know, they do not deserve to be in 100 metres of you. It's absolutely devastating to have that happen because it means that firstly, they have no regard for your own feelings. They're not empathetic to the way that that will make you feel as a human being. It's absolutely embarrassing if people know about this around you. And it also speaks of a man who has such dominating influence over your life that in spite of the fact that he's done this before, you go ahead believing that this time it will be okay because you're hoping a bung hope that he is actually gonna go ahead with the wedding the next time. And he cancels it again, another two times. And what I was saying about being a sales rep, sometimes you do get sales reps who are just con artists and they can sell you whatever without you even knowing that you're being enticed into this fabric of lies about whatever the product is. They're just so good at convincing you that it's going to change your life or going to be amazing that you buy into it. And we see that play out constantly where con artists are concerned. Paul Hemmings has to be that kind of mindset and makeup on a personality level because Natalie clearly believes him when she goes ahead and arranges the weddings again and again. Natalie's friend and a colleague of hers said that Hemmings made Natalie feel really bad and that from their point looking in, they genuinely felt that she was living a really unhappy life with him, that he was incredibly manipulative, he was controlling, he was hugely possessive, but that he wasn't kind to her. And on top of that, there was mental and physical abuse. And cancelling a wedding three times, that's mental abuse without a shadow of a doubt. Some people could stand on the sidelines and say, well, hey, maybe he wasn't ready. Okay, well, you know, we'll give you that once. But if you then enable somebody to plan another wedding and you cancel that and then you do it again and cancel that, it's not about not being ready. That's about liking the pain that you inflict. It's about making that person, your partner, feel so thrown away that you can make these life-changing decisions that humiliate them without a blink of an eye. He liked to embarrass her. And apparently his controlling nature didn't just stop with her. It actually extended to their children as well. So first of all, we have to remember that when you have a domestically abusive partner, if they are being abusive to you in the home, which more often than not they will be, your children are witnessing that. Even if they don't see that individual physically aggress you, they know how it feels in the home. When we talk to children who have survived these situations, they talk about knowing, a sense of knowing, because the way that ultimately the energy is in the environment shifts dramatically when somebody is violent. Or they talk about witnessing a parent with bruises afterwards or crying and so on and so forth. So the children are automatically victims because they're either witnessing the abuse or they're witnessing the prior or aftermath experience of that abuse. And the kids also said that they had to deal with their father's temper firsthand as well. And Kirsty, who we can automatically assume Hemmings is going to have more of an issue with. And again, I'm not saying that I have evidence that validates my theory. I'm saying that having worked with step families, I am acutely aware that on the whole, a biological child suffers less than the stepchild because the abusive parent sees the stepchild as a threat, an extension of a life that existed prior to them coming into, in this case, Natalie's life. Kirsty 
examples the fact that she had a past and she is a product of that past. So he's likely going to feel at times frustrated and angry and utilize Kirsty as a direction to vent those feelings and to use the fact that Natalie was with somebody else as an excuse for doing that. And Kirsty actually said that she was once made to stand in the naughty corner for 13 hours because basically she left an apple in her bag and it had turned soggy. It's what kids do. You give them fruit in their lunch bags for school and I don't know, they have a chocolate biscuit and then three years later you realise that you've invented a whole other form of penicillin that potentially could save the world if only they knew about your kitchen experiments. Anyway, I digress. We all know where I'm going with that. Now this apparently wasn't even the first relationship where Hemmings had been controlling, where he'd been abusive physically, and that makes sense because he was with Natalie Hemmings for 10 years, but he existed prior to her, and it's very unlikely that his relational experience would be a positive one in any other close connection. He reportedly said to an ex-girlfriend that the only way that she would ever leave him was in her grave, and that is terrifying. And again, a lot of people will hear their partners say things like this, and it isn't, sadly, that uncommon in volatile relationships. But when somebody uses language like that, you have to take it seriously. Think about your own relationships. How often have you threatened to physically kill somebody? It's not what we do. Only violent perpetrators do these things. I appreciate that some of you will be listening and thinking to yourselves, oh, I've definitely said to my husband or my partner at times, oh, I feel like I could kill you. And you're not actually meaning that you genuinely feel you could kill them. It's not even a threat. It's just a matter of statement. You're expressing frustration, but it's not done in a highly aggressive way that makes that person think, oh my God, this individual genuinely is threatening my life. But when somebody specifically says, if you ever leave me, you'll be in your grave. That's the only way. That is a statement about potential. And she's really lucky that she got away from him. And to put it in context, just how brutal Hemmings is, in one instance, he took that ex-girlfriend to a wooded area, he then elbowed her in the face, he broke her nose, and then after doing all of those horrific things, he made her have sex with him when they got home. He also kicked her, and then he forced her to sleep naked on the floor. That is at such an acutely criminal level, he should have gone to prison for a very, very long time. What's really sad about perpetrators and victims in domestically abusive situations is that perpetrators get to do these things because the person who is the victim loves them. It's awful, it's like love's executioner. This individual who wants to harm this human being who is loving towards them and loyal towards them in the most heinous of ways and knows that the power and influence they have over them is based in love. To use that to do such horrific things to the person that you're meant to love demonstrates the malevolence and darkness within you. And Hemmings demonstrates this very effectively in what I've just described. She was basically forced into having sex after being horrifically abused, after having her nose broken, after being driven somewhere she probably thought she was going to die, and then she's forced to sleep naked on the floor. She's banged to rights in that circumstance, but doesn't it just speak of how victims will put up with things that they should never put up with? And part of that is down to the love, and part of that is down to fearing that they won't be taken seriously. Because that's another problem that we see regularly with individuals who suffer domestic abuse. They really think that if they speak to the authorities, the authorities aren't actually going to take them seriously because they have actually been a part of that relationship and remained within that relationship. And therefore, they are complicit in that abuse. It's wrong and it's an incorrect mindset, but it's what holds these individuals to these kind of horrible circumstances. Now, on July the 26, 2007, one of the things that Paul actually does is he throws Natalie's phone really hard at her head and he strikes her head. Can we just put that into context? We're talking about a man picking up a very hard object. Yes, phones are not huge anymore. We're not talking about it back in the 1980s, where if you threw one of those at somebody's head, I don't know, the head might actually be removed. Nonetheless, you pick up your mobile phone, they're still relatively weighty, you throw that at speed, and when you're a bloke and he's a decent sized bloke, he's gonna be able to create that impact. So he wants to hurt her. 
And this apparently was on an occasion when he'd become jealous because an ex-boyfriend had texted her to say happy birthday. But that for him is a permission base to harm her. Put that into context. Hemmings has recognized that this boy or man that she's dated in the past has literally just said happy birthday because exes don't have to fall out. Exes don't have to be in situations where there's a lot of animosity. It's perfectly normal and logical that an ex might text you if you left on good terms. But for him, that's absolutely an issue because he feels that this man has stepped over a boundary that Natalie is his and that no one has a right to have any connection with her if they've been, shall we say, intimate with her prior to their relationship. So he feels that even though Natalie has had absolutely nothing to do with this action, she's not involved, she's not asked the guy to get in contact with her, she deserves punishing. That's how warped his logic is and that's how dangerous these human beings are. They are looking constantly for a way to permission base their abuse and that gives him one. And even though she's actually quite injured, he won't call her an ambulance. She's bleeding from the head, but he refuses to get any kind of help to intervene. He then apparently threw her on the bed. He tightened his hand around her throat. So now, not only has she done nothing wrong, some random ex has just texted a happy birthday. And bear in mind, that means that we're talking about her birthday time and this is how he's treating her. But then... Once he's injured her quite badly, the way that he manages that situation is to throttle her. This completely innocent young woman who's done nothing wrong, the mother of his children. And then when he eventually concedes and he realises that she's going to have to go to A&E, he says that if you tell anybody that I did this to you, I'm going to kill you. And that isn't something she would take lightly. Because what we've just seen is him strangling her after violently assaulting her. So she knows he absolutely has the potential to kill. Now, initially, Natalie does provide a statement to the police and she says the words, I am really scared of this man. That intrigues me, the language that's used there. Bear in mind, she's been with him for a very long time at this point. And to say, I am really scared of this man. She's not using his first name. There's a stepping to the side of who they were in the relationship and actually introducing this figure, shall we say, of fear, this man. And to some degree, that's showing you that there is a psychological detaching from him within the relationship to who he is now within the relationship and potentially is suggesting that she's having grave misgivings about the relationship and wanting to exit it. So she's using the term this man because it's more of a scenario where she depersonalizes that connection. But like so many individuals who find themselves in these horrible situations, she later withdrew that statement. And I always think it's really sad when the police have that kind of evidence, they don't just go ahead and charge the individual even though she may not prove to be a willing witness because it's a protective mechanism and it can save lives. Now in 2013, she does actually try to leave Hemmings. She moves to Yorkshire and she actually moves with her children to go and live with her sister. But he does what we see time and time again. And because I've said before, bear in mind, an abuser is not an abuser 100% of the time. Often they're a decent partner a lot of the time. So when they come and say, I'm really sorry, I won't do it again, I can't live without you, the guilt that you feel for abandoning them is huge. And the power that they have over you, you might not even be that aware of, but you've got used to the situation. And therefore it's a situation that you know, and life can feel scary when you're trying to get your life together by yourself, particularly when you're bringing up kids. And of course it's music to your ears when that person, that in spite of all of their flaws, tells you that they adore you and that they'll change. And therefore you feel maybe this time he's learned his lesson. So when he's saying to her, I can't live without you, she ends up, believing him and she ends up taking him back and that's highly manipulative but like I said 
we know this is what predators do. They can't bear to be left. They don't want anybody taking control off them. And that's exactly what Natalie had done. She'd removed power from Hemmings. She was moving forward with her life. He didn't like it. So he went to great lengths to get her back. And Natalie's family were devastated by this. They were really unhappy that she decided to stay with Paul. They knew that he was very dangerous and that there was a strong possibility that Natalie was going to come to harm. Her sister actually told her, when you dance with the devil, you're going to get burnt. And it's always heartbreaking, isn't it, when you listen to the statements made by the family and the conversations that they've had in the past with victims of murder and you know that they were loved and cared for and had opportunities to be supported as they transitioned from the relationship that wasn't working to being independent by themselves and you're hoping amongst hope that they're going to follow that through and move forward with their life and even when they choose not to, you see the family going out of their way to tell the truth, to speak the truth, to say the difficult things to that person because they love them. And even though we know that that can sometimes mean that the person decides not to tell family members about subsequent abuse, it also means that they have in the back of their mind that knowledge that those people around them, they can see through the issues that that person's facing and that they know that this individual has potential to do horrible things. And you hope that with that in the back of their mind, as situations escalate, those voices will come to the forefront and all of a sudden it'll be like, my sister said A, B or C, my mother said A, B or C, I'm going to listen to it. We get to Tuesday, May the 3rd, 2016, and this is where everything starts to change for Natalie's children in particular. So around 4 p.m., Natalie's mum, Margaret, she calls 999. And she calls 999 because she has no idea where her daughter is. Natalie's gone missing. Thames Valley Police, Suzanne speaking. How can I help? Uh, yes, my love. Um, my daughter's been missing for 48 hours. Um, we have just been up to Milton Keynes to her partner. Um, and he says he doesn't know where she is. Okay, All right. Well, can I uh, take your daughter's name, please? It's Natalie Hemming. And she said that she'd gone missing at this point for around 48 hours. She was incredibly worried about her. Why? Because it's completely out of character for Natalie. She does not disappear. She has children. She literally lives for. There is not any chance on God's earth that she has disappeared of her own free will. When Margaret was asked by the first responders what she believed had caused Margaret to be concerned about her daughter's disappearance, she responded, him. So basically, immediately, Margaret has no doubt. If Natalie hasn't come home, if Natalie is missing, there is only one person who will be responsible for that, and that's Hemmings. And it must be absolutely devastating for Margaret because let's be real. If she has reported her daughter missing and that child of hers has gone missing for 48 hours and she immediately considers him to be the culprit, it's not because she believes that Natalie has gone someone by herself. It's not because she believes Natalie is hiding. It's because somewhere in her gut she knows that Natalie isn't coming home. That mother's intuition is obviously incredibly strong with Margaret. When they start to dig into the details about when Natalie had last been seen, she had apparently last been seen on the Sunday. She hadn't turned up for work or even been in contact with anyone from work or any friends, etc. since then. And the last text that she'd actually sent had been to a friend and that was just before 5pm that particular day that she was last seen. Also, the police were immediately able to note that her phone hadn't been used after that and we appreciate that when people go missing digital footprints can end but it's quite rare even when somebody decides that they want to have a new life walk away from the life that they're living often they'll take their phone with them because it gives them access to various things such as their bank but also you're never quite closing the door it has numbers of people of meaning to you and whilst you might not want to speak to them this week, hey, you might want to speak to them six months down the line. 
So when it just goes completely blank and no technology is used, it's not pinging at different mass, it usually draws your attention to something sinister occurring. And also Natalie hadn't used her bank, so her account hadn't been used since she'd gone missing. So again, these are big red flags. And when the police come to her home, because obviously they want to search for Natalie, they obviously speak to Paul Hemmings because he is her partner. So they ask him quite a few questions. And one of the questions that he's asked when he comes in for an interview is how their relationship was. And he hesitates and then he says, it's all right. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was missing and my partner was asked about how our relationship was, because I'm missing, it's going to evoke a series of feelings, most of which will be embedded with love. So even if we were having a few problems, he wouldn't be like, oh, fair to middling, you know, I've had better, I've had worse, because that's not where your brain is. If your partner has disappeared and you love them, you will be brought distressed, dismayed, shocked, horrified, dreading what could have happened. And when you're asked, how is your relationship? If it's not going too well, you might be saying, we're having a few problems, but it's been amazing. I just wanted to come home. I love her so much, etc." You don't hesitate, figure out what's an appropriate statement. And bear in mind what we know about liars is they like to take pauses. They like to seem to be thinking about something because they believe that if you're telling the truth, you're gonna actually contemplate the actual question and think about the appropriate response. But that's not how it works with people who are honest. You're just honest. So you'd say, we've been struggling, if I'm honest, but I love her very much. I don't know what's happened to her, I just want a home. Or you'd say, we're fine, everything's fine. I don't know what's happening and so on and so forth. There's an automatic response. You're not checking out what is the right thing to say. And to be fair, Hemmings is unbelievably useless at this because even though he takes a pause, the fact that he says, it's all right. Well, all right compared to what? All right to it being really bad? All right to it being really good? Where are we going on that spectrum? It's a very odd response, full stop. Also, he's asked by the police to give his mobile phone over, of course, because often it will give you an understanding and a bearing as to how their relationship has played out and also when she was last in contact and so on and so forth. Just gonna throw it out there. I sometimes do have nightmares about, for whatever reason, me having to hand over my phone to the authorities and then some barrister in court reading out some of the messages that I've sent to my sister about certain people and doing it without the sarcastic tone and suddenly me being locked up for life. I imagine a few of you have got those. I'm very sarcastic, I'm quite inappropriate when it comes down to texting particularly people in my life. And you know, I might have a kill list in my head. It's not one I will ever action. I'm just saying I wouldn't want some barrister reading them out as if they were factual statements. So I do appreciate that people struggle with the idea of handing over their technology, but if somebody is missing that you love and you can do anything and everything in your power to bring them home, you hand it over without a second's thought. So he is willing to speak to the police, but he's not that forthcoming with them. So his story is that Natalie had been out on a Saturday night and she hadn't returned to the next day, but he didn't actually know where she stayed. He said that she'd come home in the early afternoon the next day and she was with the children at the time and that she then said that she needed to get away. It's just that classic BS, isn't it? As if you would come home with your kids, meet your partner that apparently you're in a relationship with and say to them, I need to get away. And that would be where the conversation ended. I mean, I don't think so. If your partner walks in and says, I need to get away, you're gonna have a whole heap of questions probably in chronological order, that you're going to fire at them about what do you mean you need to get away? Why do you need to get away? Where are you going? Who are you gonna go and stay with? This is how you're going to respond because you're gonna have a fear that they're leaving you. But apparently he just leaves it at that. And then surprise, surprise, when he wakes up on the Monday morning, she'd gone. Because obviously 
he was just a really heavy sleeper and he wouldn't notice his partner getting up in the night and just leaving the home. Makes no sense whatsoever, but this is a tale as old as time. We see it play out again and again and again in these circumstances and situations. So the police immediately are deeply suspicious of him and they arrest him on the suspicion of murder based on that behavior. But even though he's been arrested, clearly there isn't a body. And when you don't have a body, it's difficult to hold a person in custody because clearly whilst you're making an assumption that they are likely responsible for the disappearance and in this case potentially the murder of an individual, you have not really got enough evidence to hold them because, as I said, you haven't found the actual deceased. But apparently, as he's walking out the house, and bear in mind, as far as Paul Hemmings is concerned, they must have some strong evidence because he's just been arrested on suspicion of the murder of his partner. So he's probably imagining they've got something really firm to arrest him for. So he turns to a police officer and says, have you found Natalie then? So that instantly draws our attention to the expectation he has that Natalie is somewhere out there to be found. And she's obviously not gonna be found alive if he's been arrested for murder and is questioning an officer about having found Natalie. Police also found that his actual phone had been switched off from Sunday, May the 1st to Monday, May the 2nd. Another really deeply suspicious thing. Why would you turn your phone off? If it's not a regular habit, you're going to be doing that for a reason. And in this case, it's clear that he wouldn't want his phone mask connecting with any other. So arguably, they are deeply suspicious that he has planned and premeditated to do something during those hours, and it's highly incriminating. We get to May the 4th, 2016. At this point, they have to interview Natalie's young children, which is horrific, because these kids love their mother. They want her home. They won't even be able to conceive of the potential that Natalie's not coming back to them, that she isn't going to wrap her arms around them and she isn't going to tell them that she loves them like she does every single day. For them this is going to feel so scary, so abstract and yet in the back of their minds because they're kids they won't be able to conceptualise the fact that she may be dead and that their father may be the responsible party. When they bring them in for interview Kirsty, her daughter, didn't actually speak about how Hemmings behaved at the home and the reason that she didn't speak is because she was a little bit older and she knew that if he got wind that she'd actually talked about the relationship between him and her mother, the chances are something bad could happen to her. She said that she wouldn't have felt safe if she told anyone what he was like at all. She actually said, I was really scared as to what would happen when I got home. And again, that introduces us to just how terrifying it is to be a child in a domestically abusive situation. That even when you have the opportunity to tell the truth to the people who can help you, could help you, would help you, you're silenced because you know what you have seen. You know what you've heard. You don't want to get into trouble. You don't want to let your mum down either because at the end of the day, she's been in this relationship with this man. And as far as you're concerned, she loves him and you don't want to mess things up for her either. It's such a confusing and complex territory. And for her daughter, it is about not betraying the person that she loves, not betraying Hemmings in case there are consequences and not knowing what's best to do in that moment. But probably all the while just hoping that her mum's going to come home, that she's going to arrive in that interview, wrap her arms around her and tell her it's all going to be okay. Now, Natalie's six-year-old son, Evan, well, obviously he's younger. Things are more obvious to him. When a police officer speaks to you, you tell them the truth. So he said that their dad had actually told them that she'd left the house in the night and also that she'd felt quite sick. And he also said that he'd actually heard a really loud noise in the night and he thought on reflection, because bear in mind, this kid is six years of age. He's just a baby but he's trying to piece together in his head what the sound could be. And he said that he thought it was glass smashing. So he snuck downstairs without Hemmings actually knowing. And he managed to peek into the living room and there's a little gap in the door. At that point, he'd seen 
what he said was sick in a bowl and his mum was actually lying down on the floor. He also said, we've changed the rug. So he said that the big red rug that was obviously there before he'd seen that scene play out, he said that had gone to daddy's work so it could have a wash. So we're basically introduced immediately, aren't we, to a child witnessing the death of his mother, but not being aware of it at that point. It's heartbreaking because it just demonstrates how innocent he is and how even though as the years progress and that memory stains his conscience in the way that these memories do, he's going to build the pictures around it with the knowledge that he gleans from the internet, from what people say, and he'll have a full understanding of what truly was playing out when he so innocently looked through that gap. But now the police are aware that he is indeed a witness. One of Natalie's friends and colleagues, they said that they'd actually texted her on April the 24th. And the reason that that text was really important is that as Natalie was texting her to and forth, she said that she was gonna end the relationship with Hemmings that day. So apparently she'd started to build interest in another person from work, a guy called Simon. And they'd actually been out on a date on the Saturday, that was the 30th of April. And she actually confided in the friend that she was texting that her and Hemmings weren't actually together at that point. So when it comes down to it, if you're not actually in a relationship with somebody, they may not wish for you to go out on dates. They might not want you to have an intimate relationship with anybody else. But the reality is you're allowed to. You're not betraying anyone. If you're not in a relationship at that point with them, even if you're living in the same space, they have absolutely no right to intrude on what you do, where you go, or who you spend your time with. But you can imagine how Hemmings would feel if he even got a sniff of the potential that she was interested in another human being. My God, a guy texted happy birthday that she had no contact with, essentially, and she got badly abused for that. So imagine if he finds out that she's not just interested in another person, but she's spending time with him. But she's having these conversations with this friend. Why? Because she is hopeful. She is thinking about a future, one safe filled, one hope filled, one where she actually might come home to a place that is full of love, not full of anger and violence. And Natalie's mum actually did validate that she was telling the truth when she was texting a friend that Hemmings and Natalie had indeed split up at that point. And that again plays into the scenario when he was asked the question, how's your relationship? And he's like, it's all right. It's a non-committal response and it suggests that things are definitely not right. And it also suggests there's not a lot of feeling there as far as positive feelings go. So we get to May the 5th, 2016, when Paul is actually interviewed at the police station. At this point, they want to go through the finer detail about describing what happened the last time he saw Natalie. Because as far as they are concerned, this guy is banged to rights, isn't he? They literally have a child who's a witness to something horrible that's happened to Natalie. But he's clearly going to keep on playing dumb. So he said that she hadn't basically been herself on the Sunday. And she'd actually confided in him that she hadn't had a good time at all when she'd gone out the night before. And that she allegedly told him that something had happened that he instantly knew was something bad. Then she goes on to confide in this man who we know beats her up if a guy texts her happy birthday. So obviously the perfect person. I mean, if you're going to confess about a guy you spent time with. You're going to do it to the man who breaks your nose or beats you up or does horrible things to you because you have had a text off a man. You're going to be like, he's the perfect individual. He's going to be empathetic. He's not going to react badly. I definitely need to seek the advice of Hemmings. Said no sane person ever. And clearly, Natalie would not do that. This is the picture he's building that she confesses to flirting with a guy that she's been working with. She went to his house on Saturday night and then he raped her. So now we're being painted a picture of her being in a scenario where not only has she confided that she spent time with this man, but that this man is responsible for violating her in such a horrific way. 
At which point, somebody with the mentality of Hemmings would have reacted probably by going and, I don't know, maybe having a chat with that guy, but certainly responding by potentially getting the authorities involved because he's somebody who likes power and domination, even though it would be horrifying to find out that your partner, even though he might be an ex-partner at that point, has been through something so heinous, you're going to immediately be thinking about the consequences for that individual, particularly if you're an individual of this man's mindset. He's going to want to punish somebody, maybe not just her, but the guy who's allegedly violated her. But that doesn't happen. So they just obviously have a conversation about this absolutely horrific event. He also goes on to say that he hadn't left the house on the Sunday night, but because he isn't, shall we say, the most sophisticated liar, they are able to discount and discredit that because his car was picked up by a camera. So then when he's asked about that, his response is, no comment. Like, you've been commenting. You've lit we've literally been having a conversation. You said that the car hadn't been used, and now we've got video of you actually using the car. I am going to make no comment. But you've just been proven to be a liar. Can you not think about a story that's going to effectively explain why you're seen in this way? I'm going to say no comment because I genuinely don't have any explanation apart from the fact that I might be a massive liar. And I feel like no comment's probably the most obvious and clever way of responding in this situation. It does mean that as a round robin we've taken a vote that we all think that this is going to be enough to get you sent down for life. No comment. Anyway, this is what he does, no comment. And then when he's asked about the very incriminating situation with the rug that his son has said that he'd removed from their living room, he again goes, no comment. So now, let's just be honest, the pennies must be dropping with him, wasn't they? He's concocted this story about this rape. He's realised that actually he's been caught on camera in the car. Now he realises that there's a witness, which is his young son, and that young son isn't going to be somebody who's lying. So arguably, he's stuck in a corner. He's concocted a story that's very easy to discredit, and he must be thinking to himself, right, I have a problem here. Now, even though the police have been told by Hemmings that Natalie's been brutally raped by the guy that she'd met, the police are not going to take that verbatim, are they? They're going to check out whether it could be possible because, hey, if somebody has actually raped her, they still need to be dealt with. So they're going to look through Natalie's phone. They're going to speak to her friends and colleagues to figure out whether there is any truth in this story. And, of course, there isn't. So the messages that Natalie had been sending to her friend tell an absolutely different story altogether. So she said that she had a great time with the date. Simon was amazing, it had gone really well. And one text read, OMG, amazing. We had sex three times. And that kind of message, it's one of those that so many of us will have shared. When you're in a scenario, particularly if you've been in a very dissatisfying relationship, in this case, we're talking about a very violent and volatile one, one that makes her feel less than safe. And all of a sudden, an individual walks into your life and makes you seem visible. They notice you. They like you. You get a reflection of yourself in the present moment, not tied back to one that was you 10 years before. Because often in relationships, that's how you feel, that you've developed and changed, and that sometimes your partner's taken a different rhythm and pace and they don't see you for the human being that you've grown into. And then all of a sudden, somebody does. It's really alluring. And you might have had kids, you might have felt that there's nothing extraordinary about you, and then this person shines a light on everything that is. And you're captivated by that and you connect with them and physically you get on really well and suddenly life is full of possibilities and it sounds like that's exactly what Natalie experienced with Simon. There were also texts on Natalie's phone which she sent directly to Simon that was on May the 1st after the first date and these read thank you so much baby that was the most amazing night I've ever had you were gentle kind and caring and that meant the world to me. I fell in love with you even more last night. My mum said thank you for getting me home in one piece. So clearly, the rape claim by Paul Hemmings is absolute garbage, but also you can imagine that if he got sniff of what I've just said, he is going to be furious. Because we're talking about what he would see as multi-layered betrayal. So first of all, Natalie is seeing a guy called Simon, 
she's suggesting that she has loving feelings for him, both to her friends, but also to him directly. And that suggests time. And Hemmings is going to feel like that means potentially she's been betraying him whilst in the relationship, even though they might be split up at this moment. And that's going to be red rag to a bull. And also, she's noted that her mother is invested in the relationship between Natalie and Simon. So now he's going to feel like everybody has conspired against him. And even though he deserves every single moment of that conspiring and she should be getting away from him immediately and Simon seems like and sounds like a lovely man, he will be absolutely incandescent with rage because now he knows he's losing her. He's got evidence that he's losing her. And the fact that she's got the support of a family, that's going to really upset him. And the reason that he would have created that rape claim, of course, is all about trying to shift the suspicion of her disappearing onto the new love interest and away from himself without him thinking, I don't know, that we're living in quite modern days and times and the police are automatically going to be like, let's look at her phone records. But Hemmings obviously thinks of you such a bright character that at the end of the day, they'll just take his word for it. It does defy logic reason, reality, and everything else that any of these killers, because I've covered stories like this before, genuinely feel they can outsmart the authorities. And I know that the police do make mistakes. We've covered those on this channel as well. But with respect, it's like these horrible predators are so arrogant and so superior in their belief about themselves that they genuinely think that somebody who is adored by people around them can just disappear. And everyone will be like, oh, well, she's just left to get a new life. And that that will be accepted. And I genuinely feel that's partly to do with the fact that people like Hemmings don't feel like you or I. They haven't got the capacity for the depth of care and love and compassion that we truly feel for others. So for him, a human being is negligible. If he doesn't see that person again, so what? Even if that person is the mother of his children. But that's something broken in his psyche that he just cannot comprehend. Others don't have such a fracture themselves. So for somebody like Paul Hemmings, he genuinely believes that people will buy in for that story and then after a matter of time, everyone will forget Natalie and move on with their lives. But the police have got hold of this information. They know that Simon hasn't raped her and they know indeed she was moving on. Now, in addition to those texts, they had CCTV data from the date that Natalie had actually been on and she looked incredibly happy. It's clear that Simon and her had a, literally a wonderful date, a perfect date. And it's both infuriating and devastating that Natalie is finally clearly happy, finally clearly with a man who makes her feel as special as she deserves to feel. That she's found someone who's going to treat her well after spending so many years in such a toxic, abusive, violent, despicable relationship because of the way that Hemmings treated her. Now, the team who were investigating the situation, when they're looking at Natalie's home, there's lots of information that demonstrates that they're dealing with a homicide. So they find drops of blood on the coffee table in the living room. And there were also red fibres, which were presumably from the missing red rug and also traces of blood in the boot of Hemmings' car. So the police clearly know we're dealing with a murder investigation. This isn't a missing person. It's highly unlikely that Natalie is coming home. We get to May the 6th, 2016. This is when Paul's interviewed again whilst he's in custody. He then says that he knows in his heart that Natalie is alive. I know in my heart that Natalie is alive. Oh, right. Okay. No problem. Um, do you want to get your belongings that we took from you when you were brought in, take your shoelaces and stuff and uh, enjoy the rest of your life. Thank you. I appreciate that you believe that Natalie is alive because she's alive in my heart. We're really thrilled. It's great because we really didn't want to have another murder case on our hands. So it's just really nice to know that she's probably gone off and is having a great future with someone else, somewhere else, without her bank account, without her phone, without any of those things. But it's great that you've cleared this case up for us. Do you know by any chance about any other cases in your heart so that we can just tick them off as well? I'll have a think and come back to you. Honestly, 
I would end up acting like that if I was the police officer before, obviously, bolting him down to the floor. You're not legally allowed to bolt people down to the floor, am I? Stop making up new rules. But you know what I mean? Just sitting in front of somebody who's clearly lying, who thinks it's saying that he knows in his heart Natalie is alive as he knows. So the police present Paul with this theory that he'd actually murdered Natalie after finding out that she had indeed been having sex with another man. And his response is, what you were saying is that I have killed my partner, I've disposed of a body, I've tidied the house, made it look pristine, managed to cook them dinner, managed to take them to the zoo, because that's what he did the day after he killed her, by the way. And I did all this without them knowing. What you're saying is that I have killed my partner, I've disposed of her body, I have tidied the house, made it look pristine, managed to cook them dinner and many more things without them knowing. It's exactly what we're saying, Paul. Impossible. Okay. And the detective said, yeah, that's exactly what we're saying, Paul Hemmings. That's exactly, literally, do you want to go through it again? Because you did quite well there. Quite an active listener, aren't you, in these moments? Because literally, step by step, what you just said, it's exactly what we think you did. And then he went, impossible. Because again, at the end of the day, Paul Hemmings apparently knows everything. He knows that Natalie's still alive, and he knows it's impossible for him to have actually done what the police are suggesting. Even though, shall we say, it sounds a little bit like for him, it wasn't hard to recapture all of the information that he gave back to the police, because that's exactly what he did. I'm surprised, because he's not the brightest person, that he didn't throw a few extra bits in that the police haven't even said to him, because he's literally recalling exactly what happened. So the same day, really sadly, because we're talking about the fact that Natalie Hemmings was murdered by him, he gets charged with her murder. But of course, the problem the police have got at this moment in time is they still have not found her body. So they have this immensely large search. They continue constantly to look for Natalie and one of the main areas of focus is in an area that a witness had reported seeing a man walking down a disused railway line and what had been notable for them is when they were looking at him it was because he'd parked in a really strange place and it's intriguing isn't it that certain people pick up on these things that even though people park in all manner of places, when somebody parks in a particular way, in a particular place, it just alerts the suspicion because it's not normal. And I don't get me wrong, nothing came from that lead, but it shows you how desperate the police were that even when somebody sees an individual walking down a disused railway line, which lots of people will do at times, that was enough for them to think, well, this could be him dumping her body. So they go and search it. I think... What is very telling about Hemmings as a human being is he's banged to rights. They've got blood on the floor in the home. They've got it in the car. Clearly, Natalie Hemmings had been very violently attacked by him. They've got a child who witnessed her body lying on the floor. So he is banged to rights. He knows that they are going to tie him to this crime, but he's still not willing to let them know where his children's mother is. I find that so unforgivable. There is just something so powerfully treacherous about letting her body be out in the elements and being aware that with every passing day, it makes it more impossible for her family to ever say goodbye to her physically because we know what happens when decomposition sets in. But at the end of the day, he's just sitting pretty, isn't he? He's thinking, they haven't got enough on me. They haven't got a body. And if they don't find a body, then there's a likelihood I won't be convicted. So even after everything he's done, even though he knows the authorities are on to him, even though he recognises that his own child has witnessed part of what he's done to somebody he was meant to love, he's hoping above hope that she's never going to get found. That those children will never get to say goodbye to the woman that loved them so dearly. We get to May the 22nd, 2016. This is three horrendous weeks after Natalie's gone missing. And finally, a body is discovered in Tom's Wood at Chandler's Cross in South Hertfordshire. This is when somebody is basically cutting a hedge. Unfortunately, that person, when they are cutting the hedge, finds her body, immediately calls 999, because apparently what they could see was some legs in the bushes. 
at that moment, obviously the police are looking for a missing person or somebody they believe that is missing and likely murdered. And they think there's a really strong possibility this is going to be Natalie. When they find the body, they immediately can tell there's a fracture to the right temple of a skull. When they look in finer detail during the autopsy, they find out that her left arm had been broken, that her right arm was bruised, and they are obviously defensive injuries. She was left naked. She was left face down in the undergrowth, just tossed away, thrown away like rubbish. They later were able to confirm that the body was indeed Natalie. Unfortunately, they couldn't actually find the cause of death. It was unable to be determined because her body was in such a state of decomposition. And like I said, he would be hoping that. The more challenging it is for the prosecution to state how somebody died, the more difficult it is to actually get a guilty verdict. Now, Paul Hemmings knows he isn't going to be walking away from this crime. He knows. They know that he is the culpable party, but he doesn't want to go down for murder. No. So he pleads guilty to manslaughter. He said that he basically got angry and like with the phone in the prior situation, he basically picked up a imitation Fabergé egg, which is really large. It's an ornament. And he threw it at Natalie. This is when they were apparently arguing about her cheating. So bear in mind, he's creating a blind fury in the moment situation here. He's suggesting that he was suddenly overtaken by this anger because she was breaking his heart. He reacted. And to some degree, that's a clever defense because in these kind of moments, people can do things that are completely out of character. And particularly if you're thinking about throwing something, you can misdirect aim for the wall and impact the actual person causing them a grave injury. And that would arguably to some degree mean there was no intent and there was a level of provocation because you're arguing about the fact that she's cheating, so she's the guilty party. So he constructed this effectively in the hope that that's going to blur the boundaries between manslaughter and murder. So he says that he throws this ornament, it hits her in the head, she falls to the floor, and even though he didn't specifically aim it at her head, once it had happened, he kind of stood back in disbelief and thought, I can't believe I've just done it. He said, I just thought, shit. I'm in trouble. How am I going to explain this to the kids upstairs? And then he said to himself, oh, I'm going to cover this up. Said no innocent person ever. I mean, literally. So his first port of call when he's dealing with what he's just carried out is, oh, how do I explain it to my kids? Just going to rewind a little bit. I don't think the kids are the main focus at this moment in time. I think the authorities are probably your main concern, you know? The authorities want to know how this woman has become gravely injured or, in this case, died. I'm sure that the kids are going to be upset, but I don't think they're the ones who are going to be throwing the legal book at you and locking you away for many years. But this is what he's trying to say. He's trying to say, oh, you know, in the moment, I just didn't want to let my kids down. So I thought I'd just take Natalie's body and just dump it in some bushes. Just hope that nobody noticed. and It'll all be fine. Unbelievable. So then he said, because he was in this situation where he thought, I'm just going to have to cover this up so I don't upset my kids, as if the mother never being there again isn't going to be a bit of a problem for the kids. No, it's going to be fine. It's only the mother. They won't notice, probably. As long as they don't realise that I've actually killed her, it'll all be absolutely hunky-dory. So he wraps her body up in the rug, puts her in the boot of his car, and then takes her to the woodland and dumps her body in the wooded area. Understandably... The prosecution were like, nice try, kid. Really appreciate your uh, explanation. If this was actually just a story and not based in what we can actually see happened, maybe it would be a nice little chapter in a book. But it's not. Because the prosecution immediately recognised this is murder for stop. She had defensive injuries. That alone suggests that she tried to protect herself not just from one blow, from multiple blows. At the end of the day, you don't get injured in this way unless you're trying to protect yourself. Why do you need to protect yourself if you're just having a row about something and then so it hits you on the head and kills you? You won't have had a moment to defend yourself. It will have been out of the blue. And that's what he's trying to build up for his defense. It just happened. It was an instant. It's regrettable. He's sorry. But he can't be. 
because she was protecting herself from multiple blows. So they argue that Hemings had planned to kill Natalie and the reason that he planned to kill her was as punishment for her infidelity and for wanting to leave him. Like I said, it is so dangerous. Those initial times and periods where a person elects to leave a relationship that's violent, that's why they need support because we have to take it seriously that these kind of predators really don't like control being removed from them and they like to think that if they can't have that person, well, potentially, no one's going to have a right to have that person. And it's such a warped, distorted logic, but it's the reason that so many people are killed in these situations. We get to the 4th of November 2016 and Paul is found guilty of murder. Of course he is. He's also found guilty of obstructing the coroner and preventing a lawful burial, and rightly so. And he was actually given 20 years to life in prison and his earliest eligibility for parole will actually be in October 2036, which for many people listening in other countries will think that seems like an incredibly minimal sentence when you think about the horror that she will have endured in her final moments. When you consider the level of premeditation that will be involved, it will have been premeditated. He will have planned killing her. I'm not saying that he knew how he was gonna kill her, but I don't believe for one minute that he was ever going to let her move on happily with another human being. But obviously in the States, it's regular that people will never walk the streets again. In the UK, it's a little bit more complex. However, just because you're up for parole in October 2036 doesn't actually mean you're ever going to see the light of day, of course. Judge Richard Foster, who tried the case, he said it was obvious that Natalie was making plans to move out of the family home with her three children and that she'd become involved in a new relationship with Simon. And he said that he had absolutely no doubt that when Natalie arrived home on the Sunday afternoon, Paul was, quote, in a state of high agitation and overcome by anger and jealousy. Once the children were in bed, a violent argument arose and you attacked her viciously to the head with some kind of implement. She attempted in vain to defend herself, having murdered your partner of 10 years and the mother of your children. You proceeded in the most callous way to cover up what you had done. You stripped her naked. You put her body in the boot of your car. You drove to a remote location and dragged her body through the undergrowth. You then went on to tell lie after lie. 100% agree with that judge. I love a judge who comes down hard and also evidences not just the brutality, but the obvious nature of the barbarity regarding not just the killing, but the actions after the killing. The judge said that Natalie knew that Paul Hemmings was overbearing, controlling, jealous, and on occasion violent. He said, you said you would mend your ways, but you did not. The manner in which you have conducted yourself since the murder indicates a complete lack of remorse. Bear in mind as well, when this low life scum, when this, why are we paying our taxes to actually put these individuals up in prison for the rest of their lives? Sorry, again, let my personal feelings come through. But you know what I'm saying? He stole Natalie Hemming's life. He stole her future. He stole her children's future with her and he has no remorse. He was said, chillingly to turn to her family and mouth the words, I loved every minute of it. Oh. Now I'm not saying for one moment that guns should be allowed in a court, apart from people who are meant to have them. I know in countries, unlike the UK, there are people in court with guns and I know that they're there for a reason. But I'm saying, I'm not suggesting that the jury or the gallery should be armed with weapons that can kill. Because I think that that would mean that we'd have a lot less prisoners. But what I am suggesting is in cases where an individual mouths something like, I enjoyed every minute of it, is it not possible to just think about weapons that don't kill being used? Weapons that just injure, hurt, cause an impact, maybe create immediate retribution. 
slingshot, for example, with something sharp in it. Small arrows, not ones that can go all the way through. I'm just throwing it out there. I just think in moments like that, where somebody has firstly shown no remorse, secondly, is insulting towards the family, and most importantly, seems to take great pleasure in harming them further, some kind of immediate retribution would feel satisfying. Is it just me? Is it just me who has that thought? No, it isn't. I know that secretly most of you will be nodding your heads. Someone won't be. Someone will be like, that's totally inappropriate, Emma. I don't think you should be able to take any kind of weapon into a court of law. I get it. That's why it's good that we all have our own mindsets. It's also probably good that I'm not in charge of any legal scenarios playing out in the UK. Slingshots are ready, jury. Let's just check out how this person reacts once they're sentenced. Anyway, speaking outside of the court, after this plays out, Detective Chief Inspector Simon Steele said, the jury has concluded that Paul Hemming is guilty of Natalie's murder. He killed her in the home address on the 1st of May this year. This act followed episodes of domestic abuse experienced by Natalie at Paul Hemming's hands. And his actions have left three children to grow up without their mother. Paul Hemming is a cold and calculating killer. The jury heard that Natalie was planning to leave Paul and he believed that if he could not have a Natalie, no one else could. I agree with every single word and sentiment of that particular detective. Now let's remember the victims in this case because Natalie Hemming was a loving, adored, wonderful parent and now those children do not have her present in their lives. So her children now live with her aunts, the two girls with one of her sisters and her son with her other sister. And I am totally sure that those children are being absolutely drenched in love, but they are separated. And I'm sure that they see each other all the time, but they are separated. And I'm sure that their environment is a positive one because they haven't got the violence in the home, but they are separated. And that would not be the case if Natalie was still here. And that's a travesty and a tragedy too. I'm not saying that they're not going to grow into the most incredible people. I'm saying what they had stolen from them. And it's heartening when you hear that family members immediately open their homes to children who are left behind because they're victims of these kind of scenarios. But it's difficult to take in three children, isn't it? So it makes perfect sense that they've had to be separated because it's very expensive to look after kids. And on top of that, you don't have the space in your home, but it's really heartening to know that her family have stepped up and have invited these children to be part of their worlds because they are gonna remind them day in and day out about just how awesome Natalie was and just how much she loved those little kids. And I think it's really challenging to grow up knowing that your mother was stolen in such a way by a man that you were meant to be able to trust and they are going to have to deal with the trauma and the collateral fallout of that reality. Kirsty, who was obviously the child who belonged just to Natalie and was being brought up with Hemmings as well, she's unbelievable because bear in mind what this child has been through, bear in mind the horror that she's endured, both as a witness and now as a victim of being left due to homicide. It hasn't stopped her wanting to be I suppose, like her mother in many ways, a loving, caring, empathetic, compassionate human being, it's not led to the toxicity and resentment that I think can so often occur when you become a victim to these situations. And she's actually turning her experience into something really positive. So she's actually a domestic abuse ambassador at her school. And she wanted to do that, I suppose, because she's an open book, essentially. She's lost tragically, traumatically, horrifically in a way that so few of us can imagine. And imagine being a kid in a school where you look at somebody like Kirsty and you think, she's surviving. She's doing the best she can to help others. And I'm in a situation where I'm afraid because my mum and dad or my parent is doing something that is inappropriate towards me or towards each other. And this girl knows how that feels. It's gonna make you far more inclined to go and seek help. So basically, as domestic abuse ambassador at a school, she's letting all the students know that they can talk to her if they experience any kind of abuse and that she's going to be a safe place where she can inform them about help they can receive and places they can go for support. And she also supports Operation Encompass 
And that's actually a safeguarding partnership between schools and the police so that schools are notified if police have to attend a domestic abuse report at a student's home so that they can then receive the support in school, which is so essential because there is so much silence around domestic abuse. It's really hard when you come from a home that's experiencing and enduring it. Once you realise that other people aren't dealing with that kind of thing, it's hard to tell people that this is what you're enduring, that this is your life. And Kirsty said that it feels like a really good thing to do. She also said she doesn't want anyone else to experience what happened to us. And I don't think any victims should feel that they have to go ahead and make a difference positively to other individuals' lives who may encounter similar situations. That's not on their shoulders. It's not a burden they need to carry. But wow, when one decides that they're going to go ahead and do that, the difference that they make is incalculable. I doubt that her daughter realises that just being somebody who has gone through this and opening her arms to others who may be enduring a similar situation will help massively in that journey of another person opening up. Because you're not looking at somebody who says they can help, you're looking at somebody who says, I know this space, I've been there and I don't want you to suffer a similar fate. And from my point of view, this young woman is an example to each and every single one of us. And I hope that her siblings equally manifest the legacy of Natalie in their lives because she was stolen from them, but it feels like the foundations of love that she left with them are certainly paying dividends when you look at Kirsty's behavior. You look at a woman who left a child growing up with a light in their life that represents both the relationship she had with the mother and of course the legacy of her mother no longer being present as opposed to it eating her up and killing her in many different ways psychologically and emotionally it's something that's really helping her to thrive in many positive ways and it's testament to good parenting that that occurred it's such a sad case when you think about how this could have played out differently how natalie hemming could have ended up with simon how the children could have finally been shown a good relationship that was thriving and beautiful, and instead they lost the mother in the most horrific of ways. I really hope that he spends every single second of his time incarcerated, hopefully for the rest of his life, thinking about how he could have done it differently. I hope that she infects each of his dreams. I hope that she has power and domination over him for the rest of his natural life, because with respect, Natalie Hemming is no longer here to share her story. She's no longer here to live her life and future, but she has prevented him from having the one he would have chosen. So ironically, this domineering, violent bully, this sadist and predator, he's incarcerated because of Natalie Hemming. So essentially, likely for much of his life, if not the rest of his life, she is the person responsible for the lock and key each and every day that affords him his hour of exercise, that feeds him the flavorless food that he'll receive in prison and that prevents him from breathing fresh air in freedom for many, many years to come. So essentially, all that power and control he thought he had, now Natalie has in another universe, in another paradigm until finally she gets to meet her children again, knowing that she and he will never share a heavenly space together because he's going to be in that elevator straight down to the fiery depths of hell. Let me know your thoughts on this. As I always note, if you are dealing with an abusive relationship, remember they can be really loving, charming people 95% of the time. They can be good to you. They can be good to your kids. They've been good to your family. But if that additional amount of time is spent in terror, fear, violence, get out. Get out. You don't deserve 95% of a good thing. You deserve 100%. And yes, every relationship has bad times. And yes, we all behave badly at times in relationships. But if somebody raises a hand to you, 
if somebody controls your finances, controls where you're allowed to go, controls what you wear, and so on and so forth. Whether it's a violent, predatory relationship, or whether it's a coercively controlling relationship, get out. You will, like Natalie Hemmings would have, meet the right person eventually. She'd managed that. She had it stolen, but she'd achieved it. Take Natalie Hemmings' advice. Even though she didn't get to live her life with Simon, she was making those moves to find somebody who really deserves you. Acknowledge that you deserve the good times far more than the bad times and that when those bad times happen as inevitably and invariably they do in relationships that that person you will not live in fear of because that's the key no one should ever be afraid of their partner if you're afraid of yours make moves to find freedom because there is something and someone way better waiting for you and everybody deserves that in their world Take care, guys. Be safe.